Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including David S. at Surf Ski Snow, Jed M., and finally Paul M. Blake Steele is on the show today. Blake is president and CEO of Arzaga Uranium, a U.S. focused uranium explorer and project developer working to advance the Dewey Burdock project in South Dakota. The company is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol A. ZZ and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol AZZUF. Blake, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Andrew. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming on. Well, let's let's start off uh having you tell us a little bit about your background, Blake, and then why you uh entered into this uranium sector. Yeah, no, no, sounds good. I, I actually started my career way back as a bean counter uh at Deloitte in uh in Vancouver. And, uh, you know, Vancouver is really the hotbed of mining in, in Canada there. So uh, my, my affinity towards mining started at a, at a young age, um, you know, and, and I realized, uh, you know, being a bean counter and working in auditing wasn't for me. Uh, from there, I moved into corporate finance, valuation, and then, you know, then had the opportunity ultimately to join South Kobe Resources, which was a Ivanhoe Mines Group company at the time. And and for me, you know, you know, growing up and, and living on the west coast of Vancouver, you know, that was that was an awesome opportunity at the time for me to build my career. Uh, and you know, while we were at South Gobi, we raised nearly a billion dollars in capital to finance the development of our flagship mine and ramp up operations there. And you know, after after South Gobi, um, you know, some some colleagues of mine from the Ivanhoe Mines days and South Gobi days, we. Uh, we saw an opportunity and, and effectively got the band back together again, and uh, Azargo was born. And, and you know, we saw uranium as a compelling play, and we knew it was going to be a, a long-term play. It wasn't something that was going to happen overnight, but the, the longer-term fundamentals of the market stacked up, and uh, we saw it as an exciting opportunity. Well, Blake, we asked this of most of our uranium-related guests. What are your thoughts on the status of this uranium market? Yeah, no, look, I, I think it's, you know, there's a number of people that have been quoted lately as being cautiously optimistic. Um, you know, but I'm going to have to say from my perspective, I am actually very optimistic at this point on the turnaround in the uranium market, regardless of the U.S. working fuel group recommendations, which which could be another positive catalyst for the U.S. nuclear industry. But I think I think we need to look past that. The uranium market fundamentals are stronger than almost any other commodity, if not all, at this point in time. I mean, you know, 75% of uranium production is not making money. Eventually, prices are going to have to move north here. And, and I think if we look at the nuclear fuel report, um, which, which looks at the entire nuclear fuel cycle, and that was just released by the World Nuclear Association a couple of weeks ago, and, and that comes out every two years. For the first time in eight years, nuclear power and uranium demand projections rose in all three scenarios. In, in the reference case scenario, which, which is really the base case scenario, uranium demand grew by 1.8%. And pretty, pretty impressive numbers here. And I think, you know, a lot of the main reasons um, for this change was you've had modification of energy policies globally. I mean, you look at France. They've delayed the reduction of nuclear as part of their overall energy mix from 75% to 50% from 2025 to 2035. They're allowing nuclear reactor operating life extensions beyond 40 years. You shift gears and you look at the U.S. State legislatures are starting to support nuclear power generation through utilities receiving subsidies. I mean, ultimately, they're recognizing the critical role that nuclear plays in providing carbon-free emissions. You know, again, in the U.S., it's granting further reactor extensions, allowing reactors to operate for up to 80 years. And that's you know, that's not to mention China and India, and you look at the extensive nuclear programs that they have in place, as well as new reactors in, in many other countries. So, you know, I, I think it's a very positive space to be in at this point in time. Nuclear electri electricity generation has risen for six years straight, not far off all-time highs. 
And, and look, globally, demand for electricity continues to rise and, and must be met by clean options. I mean, nuclear counts for 10% of the electricity globally. Um, and, and, you know, looking, looking at the market specifically, 2018 was the first time in a number of years the market had moved into a deficit position. And, and the uranium market is forecast to be in that deficit position for the foreseeable future. So not only do we need idled mines to come back online, but additional new supply is required to fill the supply demand gap. And, and really there's a, there's a misconception out there about mine restarts. You know, a lot, a lot of people will uh, compare restarting a mine to flipping a switch. You know, and I think one of your previous guests used, a, used an example of a Coca-Cola bottling factory and, and, you know, hit the switch on that. And, you know, at the end of the day, staff have to be retrained. They need to be hired, you know, significant capital must be invested. And, and in some cases, you know, it's, easier and more efficient to bring on new mines such as Dewey Burdock that have low capex hurdles and low operating costs than, than restarting existing production. So, you know, you, you look at the fact that, you know, mine supply has been significantly reduced on the back of production cuts. You know, we're talking in excess of 40 million pounds of idle capacity here. Secondary, secondary supply is expected to gradually decrease. You know, increased U308 demand will reduce underfeeding and tails enrichment. You know, less capacity for, for enrichers. Less capacity ultimately means less secondary supply, as, you know, as do tighter optimal tails requirements, which we've seen in recent contracts. So, I, you know, in short, uranium prices need to incentivize restarts and new production and exploration to meet increased uranium demand projections. There is, there's been a lack of investment in the sector for over three to four years. Utilities have been relying on the drawing down of inventories and other means of secondary supply to make up the uranium supply demand gap. But, but it's a dangerous game at this point. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll listen to the uranium bears throw around numbers of above ground inventory figures, you know, 1.4 billion, 1.8 billion. But the reality is much of this inventory is not mobile. You need to back out depleted tails, holdings by financial entities, holdings by governments for strategic purposes. And, and, and in that figure, you also need to remove China, who is aggressively ramping up nuclear power generation. And, and if you look at the U.S. utilities specifically, they hold just over two years worth of inventories, which is actually at the low end of historical norms. And, and fuel cycles are long. I mean, we're talking 18 to 24 months to go from mining a pound of uranium all the way through the fuel fabrication cycle. So, you know, markets are going to react early. Utilities need to start contracting. And, and, and frankly, they have. You know, security supply is the most important consideration for utility as the input cost of uranium is negligible relative to the overall cost of operating a reactor. You know, we've seen Cameco um, recently contracting and, 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 you know, though the exact pricing figures have not been disclosed, we can also almost be certain it was higher than the quoted long-term price of $32, which to me really, and, and we can come back to this later maybe, but the, the $32 long-term price really means nothing as no meaningful contracts are being signed at these levels. So I think, you know, if you look at the market as a whole, you've got the continued supply curtailments by Cameco and Kazataprom. Kazataprom recently announced that they would be extending their supply curtailments through 2021. You've got a decline in inventories. You've got significant producer purchasing. You know, Cameco is expected to purchase 10 to 12 million pounds of uranium before the end of the year to fulfill con uh, commitment obligations. And, and again, we've seen evidence that the utilities are, are starting to contract again through Cameco's increased contract books. So, you know, in my view, prices should start to move higher. Um, and in my view, the market is very vulnerable to a supply shock at this time. The perceived overhang of excess uranium is misleading. Um, and you, with this purchasing by Cameco and other utilities re-entering the market, that's going to put upward pressure on uranium prices before the year is out. And, and as I said, that doesn't even take into consideration the potential positive market response from uh, recommendations out of the U.S. Nuclear Fuel Working Group. And, and just, just one last point here. Sorry, I've been talking a lot here, Andrew. But uh, to put inventories into perspective, earlier this year, Cameco was seeking offers for one million pounds in the spot market. But they could only fill one third of, the, of that order at market price. 
So there, there really is to me a, a misconception between perceived availability and supply and actual supply. Um, you know, if, if looking at it simplistically, if there was excess supply, I mean, would the spot price really be holding nearly half a year at $25 a pound? Well, you covered a lot there uh, and at all very positive. And it would be nice to know, and we'll find out soon, uh, what the real depth of the market is when, when Cameco attempts to do what they do. Um, yeah. I'm still not convinced yet that they uh, that there isn't a little bit of game playing going on, um, but you know we'll we'll see how this plays out and and we'll get our answers uh, you know as things go on. Um, and then also you know I don't I don't know how many people show a hands of the equities out there that wants to sign a contract at thirty two dollars. I, I just you know with the fundamentals that you have going on, I'm sorry, but even if you have a project that that uh, proclaims an all-in all in cost of, of 10 or 12 bucks a pound uranium. I, you, I don't know why you would still want to even consider signing one at 32. I would look for higher, but that's just me. And, and given the market fundamentals, I think that supports my statement. And then with your uh, comment about yeah. the Coca-Cola bottling factory and being able to restart that, I would just put it in perspective. For the uranium market, and restarting a mine is like trying to restart a Coca-Cola bottling factory in Venezuela. Good luck. <laughs> and uh, so, so you know, that's 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 my statements there. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's move on. And I really appreciate your update and and your thoughts on the market. I think they're uh, they're spot on. No pun intended for the the spot price. How do you think investors should approach this market when they look at it now? You know, they everybody agrees on the ultimate direction, or at least you know the the bull crowd uh, goes with with an agreement on the ultimate direction but maybe they don't know when to pull the trigger. What are your thoughts from an investor perspective? Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, ultimately every investor needs to do their own research and be comfortable. But uh, from, from my perspective, if you look at the entire industry, it, it is a market capitalization of roughly $10 billion. And, and the majority of that is in names, Cameco and Kazataprom. Um, you know, and, and if you, you know, if you want to start building positions in these equities, uh, you have to do it before there's dramatic swings in prices. I mean, the market, you know, as, as we touched on earlier, my viewpoint is that, the, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think we're hitting an inflection point in the market in the next couple of months here. Uh, I think October, November, I mean, we've already seen the upward pressure on the spot price here in the last week um, and, and the increased activity post the WNA uh, conference in London. So, you know, I, I think you, you want to be prudent and you want you want to do your research, but I think you need to get in there early. Otherwise, you're going to miss an opportunity to really ride the um, ride the bull market from the ground floor up. And, um, you know, look, looking at it specific to what types of companies you want to be investing in. Well, I mean, I, I look at Azarg Uranium and I look at us specifically and I say that we provide investors with the optimal leverage into the uranium market. You know, we are we are debt free. Um, you know, we continue to de-risk Dewey Burdock. We're not in production now, which, you know, frankly, is, is a fortunate position and it makes my job a lot easier. You know, we're continuing to de-risk from a permitting perspective. We've got an updated PEA on the horizon um, and, and we're moving into a much stronger market um, where, where we could receive some further support from the U.S. Working Fuel Group recommendations. So uh, I, I think you want to start looking at building uh, building positions now if you're if you're already not uh, in the market. Absolutely. You have to have something now and it makes a lot of sense to be in that position and also have cash for opportunities as it comes along. I, I completely agree with, with what you're saying and, and it makes sense at this total industry market cap level. It makes a lot of sense to have exposure now. It's just too great of a miss out to not have it. Well, let's get on to the company. Let's uh, tell us a little bit about the key management folks there. Uh, give us a little bit on the capital yep. structure and also key shareholder backing, and let's let's go with that. Sure. And if I forget to address one of those as I get onto my answer, just interrupt me at any time. But um, look, uh, our management team has over a hundred years combined experience in the ISR space, and and that's going to include permitting, development, and production of ISR uh, assets globally. Um, and for for a company of our size, a development stage company in the U.S. that you know is, is very advanced, I think that's a pretty special asset for us to have. I mean, our, our chairman Glenn Catchpool, he is the former CEO of Uranus, which was acquired by Energy Fuels. He's got over 40 years' experience in the ISR industry. Our COO John Mays, 
Uh, you know, he's worked with ISR producing businesses in both Kazakhstan and the U.S. for 20 plus years. So, you know, from an operational standpoint, ISR permitting, you know, we, we're, we're, I think we've got a management team that is, uh, you know, one of the best in the industry. You know, looking looking at our capital markets experience and um, it, 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 our depth of knowledge across the uranium sector, global capital markets. Again, I, I think it's it's difficult to compete, and I think I think uh, the team is uh, you know one of the assets of our business. So, you know, you're going beyond that. And, and sorry, Andrew, I've already forgotten what your second question is. So, if you don't mind refreshing my memory, that would be great. Sure. Tell us about the key uh, shareholders and then also the capital structure as far as maybe shares out and, and what the situation is yeah. there. Yeah. So our, our market cap right now is around 35 million. We've got 185 um, million shares outstanding. We're debt free, um, you know, and, and that debt free position really helps us provide that optimal leverage uh, into the equity appreciation as this market turns. You know, we don't have any contracts signed. We're fully exposed. And, and I think that's a position you want to be in. And in terms of core shareholdings, um, you know, we've got a lot of strong institutional ownership. Um, and, and these are funds that have been supportive for, you know, a, as recently as a year plus to, you know, three to five years. Um, but I think what's also important with our, with our business is the insider ownership and the, the ownership of management and directors in this business. You know, we, we've got our own skin in the game. We've, we've put significant amounts of our own capital into this business. And I think I think that's important, um, particularly looking at, you know, investors, outward investors looking into this business. They want to see that management and the board and, and their initiatives are aligned with the rest of shareholders. And I think, you know, I think that's something we can speak to strongly. You know, as an example, I own approximately three percent of the equity of this business um, and, and other management members and directors have, have large holdings as well. And and the one thing I will say about the Ivano Mines Group and the Cell Kobe Group is it's 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 almost like a family. You know, we have a lot of supportive shareholders from that part uh, of the world and, and that time in my life that have backed us in what we're doing here as well. How about uh, the efforts by management at current share prices? How how is management approaching alignment with shareholders? Well, I, I think from that perspective, you know, we've we've done everything we can to minimize our costs in the organization and avoid dilution while continuing to progress the project. And I mean, if you look back at our last three capital raises, I mean, they've ranged from, you know, 23 cents to 26 cents. So, um, and I think I want to say that's going back to 2016, possibly a little bit earlier. So and I, from, from our perspective, you know, focusing on minimizing that cash burn and putting the money into the ground and advancing the Dewey Burdock project. And, and you know, we, we can talk about some of those milestones we've achieved with our project specifically. Um, and, and, you know, completing the uh, the merger with yours and energy, really adding scale um, and diversification to our business. I, I think, I think you know, ultimately shareholders can take a look at that and see that we, you know, we're not just talking um, a position. We're, we're doing everything we can to protect that position and, and avoid and protect shareholder value. Let's get on a little bit to the project. Uh, can you give us an update on the status of the EPA permitting and also the NRC hearing? So, I mean, I'll, I'll just touch broadly on uh, our focus, getting the Dewey Burdock and run through the permitting situation there for you. And, and you know, as, as you said, we're, we're focused on low cost uranium assets in the United States. You know, ultimately, we want to be America's next uranium producer. Our flagship project is the Advanced Stage Dewey Burdock Project. It's located in South Dakota, USA. Um, and, and the Dewey Burdock Project is one of the leading undeveloped in situ recovery projects in the US, if not the world. And, and why I say in situ recovery um, is, and I want to point this out to your listeners, is in situ recovery accounts for roughly 50% of uranium production in the world. And it accounts for the lowest cost form of uranium mining. So, you know, looking at Dewey Burdock and relative to its peers, you know, we're ISR, but we also possess a sector leading combination of grade and scale. Our measured and indicated resources are almost 17 million pounds. We have another 800,000 pounds of inferred resources. Our grades are two to three times that of current producing ISR mines in the U.S. Um, so, I mean, that really stacks us up quite well. Uh, in, in terms of current initiatives and what we're working on right now, um, you know, we're, we're 
currently preparing an updated preliminary economic assessment for the Dewey Burdock project in the fourth quarter, and this goes back to that previous question to some degree, in the fourth quarter of 2018, we significantly increased our resource estimate as well as the confidence of our resource estimate. And, and this was done in a very cost efficient manner. You didn't wanna be out there drilling in 2016, 17, 18. Uh, when the market was going through some challenging times. You wanted to be preserving capital, but yet at the same time, we wanted to be advancing our projects. So what we did is we acquired a large database and, and we commenced a review of all of this historical data. And that historical data review and, and you know, our, our geologists uh, working day and night for 18 plus months, looking at thousands of historical logs and, and uh, you know, hats off to them. They did a great job there. Um, and, and, you know, that work increased our measured and indicated resources by 97% for our Dewey Burdock deposit. And, and of importance, all of that resource estimate, all of that update falls within the NRC license boundary. So, you know, from that perspective, that larger and more contiguous resource, and we've said this publicly before, but we highly expect to achieve improve, improved PE economics on the back of this. So, and, and frankly, uh, you know, I think our uh, previous PEA already demonstrated robust economics. You know, we had direct cash costs of $12.53, all in sustaining costs in the low 30s, and upfront capex of $27 million. So we're, we're talking about first quartile cash costs, sector leading capex, uh, sorry, a sector leading capex hurdle for a project of this size. And, uh, you know, we, we aren't talking billion dollar capex hurdles that projects in the Athabasca Basin have to overcome. So, you know, we, we look at Dewey Burdock as internationally competitive project. And, and I think that's how we want to position it. Now, uh, shifting gears a little bit and looking specifically at the permitting components of Dewey Burdock, you know, we, we're in the finalization stages of permitting at Dewey Burdock. We've received, there's two key federal permits. There's the Nuclear Regulatory License Commission and the EPA permits, we've received the Nuclear Regulatory Commission license. And on that license, there's one final contention that we're working through. And, and this is the hearing that you were referencing earlier, uh, Andrew. And, and a hearing for this contention was recently held a couple weeks back in South Dakota. Um, and, and from our perspective, we feel that the hearing went very well. And, and we look forward to this contention being resolved and further advancing our asset. The decision date uh, is set for December 6th. Uh, at this point in time. And, and look, that should be a fixed date. There shouldn't be any movement from that date. But, um, you know, and that, that gives us the opportunity to resolve the final contention on the NRC license and be free and clear from that perspective. We uh, we actually just received a couple weeks back our revised draft EPA permits for the Dewey Burdock project. And that, that was another significant milestone for our business. The, the, prior, um, the prior draft set of permits that we received, you know, not that there was any anything in them that was detrimental to the project, but there were certain some items and items in there that were would have created operational inefficiencies. So, you know, we comment on that and, and the uh, the EPA addressed the majority of our comments. So we're, we're very happy with the revised EPA permits that we've obtained. Uh, and now we can focus on receiving those final EPA permits in the near term. And that's, those are really the two key federal permits um, that, um, and again, we're almost there on that front and looking at the state level, um, those permits have already been recommended for approval, uh, and the final issuance, the final issuance, and the final hearing that needs to take place at the state level has ultimately been put on hold until we finalize the federal permitting process. Yeah, and typically, if 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 the EPA and the NRC final uh, punch list items come out positive and everything's good there, then I, I suspect the state will fall in line with what they recommend there. So on the EPA permitting now on the revision that they've sent back, do you see that the company will will be accepting those revisions and and we can uh, expect a finalized EPA permit? Oh look, look I, I, as I said, I think the majority of our comments um, have been addressed, and uh, you know it's it's a very comprehensive document. I'm sure we'll have a couple of other comments on this draft, but nothing. Nothing in my mind significant enough to revision to sorry to result in another revised draft set of permits. I, I think the next stage in this evolution is moving to, moving to the final permits, and and I, I think that's at this point um, going to be sooner rather than later. Um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to be looking at another year before we have the final permits in our hand. I think we can look at the front half of next year 
um, as a timing for those final permits. And Blake, what if, and I know this is probably unlikely, but, but certainly possible, what if the final permitting is not granted in the current forum? What are the backup plans to, uh, to go after this project? Oh, well, I mean, at, at this point, uh, I, yeah, I, I would say that is that is a, a very minimal uh, scenario. I, look, I, I don't actually even foresee that happening, um, but I, I don't see a backtracking occurring at this point. I mean, technically speaking, the NRC has already blessed this project. Um, you know, there's been years, ample years of studies. I think this uh, this permitting process has been ongoing for 10 years now. Um, you know, uh, large amounts of due diligence have been conducted on this project. The geological components are thoroughly understood. Um, and, and I just don't see a situation where we go backwards, I guess, from this point in time. I, I think we're, you know, uh, uh, the seventh inning stretch here and, and these permits are going to be, uh, you know, issued in a form that's quite similar to this last draft. Very well. Well, Blake, give us your anticipated timeline on Dury Burdock, assuming everything gets cleared on the permitting side. Tell us about your upcoming milestones and when this project might actually see production. Look, yeah, and that's a bit of a, a bit of a difficult one because that obviously, um, you know, requires some time forecasts on the market and some of these other things you know with a $32 long term price we we won't be bringing this thing into production I'll, I'll be frank with you there Andrew but as I said I, I think the mar the market is susceptible to supply shocks at this point in time so um, I think the market is going to start to move sooner rather than later so you know from from that perspective I mean looking at it broadly speaking another advantage um, to ISR projects relative to um, conventional projects is, is not only do they operate at typically two thirds the cost of conventional mines, but that capex hurdle is 15% of conventional mines. And projects, you know, projects can ramp up and be built in a matter of months as opposed to five or ten years. Um, and you know that that significantly less upfront capex really ensures that that project financing hurdle isn't an issue in a in a solid and strong uranium market. So, you know, I, I think. Given that the advanced stage of permitting that we're in with our Dewey Burdock project, we're going to be well positioned to take advantage of the uptick in the market here. Um, and, and, you know, from the, the time we make the decision to commence construction through to initial production, we're looking at a period of 12 to 15 months. So, so we can ramp up aggressively if need be once we get these permits behind us. Well, I appreciate your honesty there. So is it safe to say possibly uh, 2023 is probably a pretty safe target? Is that, is that about right? That's certainly achievable, and in reality, I think we can do it quicker than that. Um, you know, if, if we get through the federal permitting process and state permitting process next year, I mean, you know, you, you could be looking at 2021 production. But um, again, as I said, a lot of things are going to have to align. Well, let's uh, let's move on uh, and let's talk uh, local communities. Yeah. How are things going there with the local communities, uh, the town of uh, Edgemont? Uh, how, how do they see this project? Uh, how is the sentiment there? And are you seeing that there's a heavy, overwhelming a, a amount of support, or do you see some opposition? Uh, how does it look there? Look, I mean, when we had the uh, the EPA hearings, uh, I want to say last summer, um, you know, the town of Edgemont was very supportive. I mean, there was a lot of people that came out um, and were very supportive of this project. Our, our project manager on the ground there, Mark Hollenbeck, was born and raised in the area. Um, you know, he's got li lifelong relationships with the people in this community. Um, the people in the community, you know, ultimately trust the business and they trust him. And, um, you know, I, th I think it is important to, to remember if, if we look back in the 50s, 60s, 70s through the other uranium boom, there was a lot of uranium mining that took place in and around Edgemont. It was quite a prolific uranium production region, all, all conventional production. There was a, there was a processing plant, a mill. Um, near the town of Edgemont that employed a lot of people. So I think I think overall people are looking at you know ISR operations or the environmental impact is manageable. The social and economic benefits for the region uh, in that area of South Dakota will be very substantial to people. I mean and, and ultimately in this area in Edgemont there, there's a school that every year the, the question is well is it going to have sufficient budget to remain open? And 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 I think they see this type of Pro productive development 
um, you know, providing vast benefits to their community. So, um, you know, I, I would generally say that the landowners, the community, everybody is very supportive of the project in the immediate area. Um, you know, we, we do have some opposition and, uh, and that opposition, I would say, is broadly, you know, for much further away from the project and, and the supporters of it, that it would directly impact. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Right. Well, no, it's interesting how you have the opposition is conveniently some distance where they're unaffected from from the operations and that just happens to be where you have the opposition which is which is interesting in itself um and their position yeah. not having any 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 risk uh it's interesting and i think you made some smart moves with with the project manager and also getting involved with 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 the school system there and so forth i mean this is a pretty remote area so what are the economics like in this region i mean how do people really make a living to put food on the table Look, there's, there's a lot of cattle ranching um, in that area, um, you know, sheep, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, if you, if, you, if you spend some time out there, it's very gentle, just sort of, you know, grasslands, the odd hill here and there. And, and, and again, I mean, that, that's the beautiful thing about ISR mining is, is you're talking about drilling wells where you can have cattle grazing, you know, within three feet of these wells. Um, obviously, they're fenced off, but the, 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 there's no overburden removal. There's no drilling of mine shafts. It's not environmentally invasive. So, you know, this project will have minimal disturbances to, you know, the, the primary livelihood of these cattle ranchers at the project site. And at the same time, it's going to be generating additional economic benefits for, for not only not only the people that have the surface rights and the mineral rights. And it is it is all private. It's primarily private land ownership out there. Um, and, and we've leased the surface and the minerals, uh, you know, for the entire project area. Um, but it's also going to have a benefit, as we talked about, to the, to the infrastructure of the town of Edgem Edgemont. And it sounds like cattle coming out and grazing on nearby the project is much easier than cattle trying to graze on a solar panel project. <laughs> so much, much easier. We're, we're certainly a, a less of a significant footprint, we'll put it that way. So for those that are uh, not uh, familiar with the preliminary economic assessment, and I know the update's coming, but the, the, the one in the past, can you highlight the details defined in that PEA and what are you doing and looking at with this updated PEA? Yeah, look, I, I, I can broadly touch on the 2015 PEA. I, I just have to point out for your listeners that that is historic um, and that was completed before the latest resource update. And again, in that latest resource update, we increased measured and indicated by 97%. So um, take it, you know, just be cognizant that it is more, I'm, I'm speaking to history um, more than current, but uh, uh, lawyers have told me I have to say that. So I, I, I hope you can appreciate that. So so, so again, you know, the, the NPV of the project at that time, and, and this was at a $65 price point at that point in time, was, was $150 million pre-tax. Now, I think we can realize that the long-term price is coming down a little bit from that $65 price point at that time. But at $65 a pound, we were kicking off on average $50 million of EBITDA uh, from that project a year. So, I mean, very strong economics. C1 cash costs $12.53, all in sustaining costs in the low 30s. Um, and, and, you know, again, that upfront CapEx hurdle of $27 million. Um, put put the economics of that project in 2015 on, on very very solid financial footing, and and what we've done here is we've significantly increased the resource and we've made that resource larger and more contiguous. So, you know, we would have an expectation as we further define the continuity of the deposit and increase the scale that we're going to achieve cost savings, and and in my view, those cost savings that we're going to achieve. Are going to more than offset the you know the whatever price assumption we ultimately decide to use in this upcoming PEA. So, you know, and, and the one other thing that I think is quite interesting about the project, and we haven't touched on, is there are several miles of mineralized trends that remain to be further delineated. You know, it, it's not you know 17 million pounds measured and in, in indicated plus a million pounds of inferred, and that's it. There, there's a lot of upside to this project as well. Um, and, and again, there's been historical estimates um, on, on the Dewey Burdock project itself that talk about uranium trends and mineralization uh, in the mid-20s in terms of millions of pounds. So, 
you know, not only is this PEA going to build on what we've already achieved in terms of expanding that resource, and again, we expect it to provide improved economics, but there's still potential for further growth um, at Dewey Burdock. And not, not to mention, I mean, we've also got Dewey Terrace, which is directly adjacent to Dewey Burdock on the Wyoming side of the border. And, and when our geological team was doing that historical data review on Dewey Burdock, they identified significant uranium mineralization at Dewey Terrace. And, and when I say directly adjacent, I mean, it's just the continuity of the land holding straight directly across the Wyoming border. So, you know, from our perspective, Dewey Terrace has the potential to become a satellite project and supplement the existing resources at Dewey Burdock. Um, you know, so at, at Dewey Terrace, again, we're continuing the evaluation of historical data here, ultimately with the goal of identifying further uranium mineralization and quantifying this. For the listeners, by all means, uh help yourself uh, to, to CEDAR and you can look up this this uh, historic uh, PEA and take a look at that. Uh, now, can you can you just expand a little bit uh, back on the historic PEA? What was yeah. the what was the pre-production CapEx and then also sustaining CapEx? Yeah, so the, the pre-production, the upfront CapEx was uh, 27 million. The all-in sustaining CapEx was $14 a pound. So, you know, when I look at are all in costs and say those are in the low 30s. You've got the, the 1253 um, in direct operating costs. You had six dollars in change in production and royalties, brings that to eighteen dollars, uh, eighteen dollars in change. Then you have the uh, sustaining capex of fourteen dollars a pound to get to the low 30s um, for your all in sustaining costs. I mean, I, I, the IRR on that project as well was, you know, on that sorry on that PEA it was 67 percent. So uh, pretty pretty phenomenal economics. Well, it'll be interesting to see what you guys use as your your baseline uranium price for this for this updated PEA, and then from there, are you guys going straight to a definitive study, or what's what's kind of the next uh, step? No, look, I mean, I think if you look at projects in the U.S., you look at you know Lost Creek, you look at Nichols Ranch, they they've been financed and uh, put into production on the back of PEA. So we've got you know over five thousand drill holes in this project already. We've done pump test studies. Um, we've, we've got a very, very thorough understanding of the geological formation that exists uh, at this project. And, and the people that prepared our previous PEA, TREC, and they've also been engaged to prepare the revised PEA, but you'll see it come out likely as Woodward and Kern, because Woodward and Kern has purchased TREC, at, at least in the US. Um, you know, they have, they've been responsible for building um, recent ISR uranium mines in the United States. So, you know, we're, we're very comfortable with the economic figures surrounding CapEx, CPP, sustaining CapEx, operating costs, um, because the people that, um, the people that are designing, that are putting together this PEA and signing off as the independent QP um, have built these projects in the United States recently. Yeah, and if you're confident, there's no point in running this, wasting this additional money on these studies and this. So, you know, if you're if you're confident and you've got what it takes to move forward, then move forward. So, how about how about the plan for financing the project? I mean, boy, it's not it's not all that much. So, what what do you see as kind of the likely plan? What do you what do you foresee there? I mean, I know it's tough to to come up with an exact what vehicles you're going to use to finance, uh, but what do you what do you see? Just give us a ballpark for investors that are listening. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I think, you know, you look at that $27 million CapEx hurdle, and again, this figure may change slightly with the revised PEA that we're working on. So just keep that in the back of your mind. But, you know, in, in terms of working capital ramp up, we've considered a $35 million raise necessary to get this off the ground. And, and how we look at slicing it, we'd look at doing about 80% of that debt and 20% of that equity in one scenario. You know, an, another scenario that's a potential uh, option that we could look at is a prepaid offtake agreement as well that would help, um, you know, build and construct this project. So, you know, we, we, we've had some preliminary conversations. I think, I think at this point we'd be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, um, but we, we've certainly thought about it, certainly in the back of our minds. And, and, and as we said, you know, we need to be ready. We need to be ready with a financing solution concurrently, if not before, we finalize the permitting process because if we're moving, we're, we're, as we move into this bull market, you know, and as I mentioned, the, the construction time on in situ recovery projects is, 
is uh, is very short. You're not talking 10 years. So we need to be able to be ready to move and take advantage of the market. And that, that's where it falls on me, ultimately. I need to deliver. Um, and I'm, I need to make sure that we have a, a financing package in place that uh, can lead to the construction of this project. Well, I think you're going to have some good options uh, at that level. I think you're going to have a lot of different ways to potentially pull this off. Well, let's move on to uh, some other assets. Can you give us an update on the Kyrgyzstan project? What is the plan here with the project? Is it a pipeline project? Is it something that needs to be monetized? Give us an update on that. The uh, yeah, the Kyrgyzstan project is is absolutely on the back burner for us. Um, you know, it's it's not a focus for our business. We're a hundred percent focused on the USA. Um, you know, we we are looking at options to divest that project. Um, to be to the point, Andrew. It, you know, we we don't want it taking up any management time. Um, and again, we we need to focus on our core projects. Focus on the U.S. I mean. I spend a lot of time talking about our flagship project, Dewey Burdock, in the U.S., but, you know, it is important to highlight that we do have a very strong pipeline of uranium projects in the U.S., in fact, totaling 40 million pounds of measured and indicated resources plus an additional six pounds of inferred resources. Um, you know, and, and, and really, if, if we look at our second sort of development project, Gas Hills, um, and Gas Hills is located in Wyoming. That 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 region has historically produced in excess of 100 million pounds of uranium, and, and and all of that was conventional production. And you know our project area previously had not been assessed from an ISR perspective. So you know what we did there is we completed hydrological studies, um, which indicated the hydraulic head or water above the ore body. Uh, and permeability are suitable for in situ recovery mining operations. So I think, you know, at Gas Hills, we're going to continue to evaluate um, future in situ recovery development options there. And that, you know, I, again, just to just to reiterate, our focus is on the U.S. and certainly not on the asset that we have in Kyrgyzstan. And Kenya, yeah, I was going to ask you about that uh, with the other assets uh, in the United States besides gas. Is there any others that uh, that are just kind of are they just more or less pipeline projects that will be in a bull market and and uh, Dewey Burdock's up and running? Is that uh, those other projects you're going to be looking at expanding those and advancing those forward? Yeah, yeah, Dewey Burdock is is definitely our primary focus um, in parallel with with Dewey Terrace. There, as we talked about, I mean, that has the has the potential to become a satellite project. So we, you know, one day that may all be wrapped up as one, and and beyond that, you know, we look at Gas Hills, and and you know, we've got some properties in the Shirley Basin there that um, are directly adjacent um, to your Energy Shirley Basin project. So that, you know, we I think there's some quite exciting opportunities down in the Shirley Basin region. Um, and then in addition, we've got the Centennial Project in, in Colorado. Um, and, and that's really, that's just additional optionality for us, as you say, um, in, a, in a bull market scenario. You know, we, um, you know, we've got some leases that we need to work through on our Centennial Project to, uh, to re-up that project. Um, but again, it's not a priority for our business. So um, we're not too concerned how that turns out one way or the other. And what is the end strategy for the company? Are you optimistic about takeovers in this sector, or is there a plan to just build this one out and become a producer? All right, look, I, I think you have to be focused on your your own business first and foremost, um, and and ultimately we want to have the team in place to put this into production. Um, and and you know we talked about our team earlier, and I, I think we do have that team with the expertise of Glenn and John on the operational side. You know, we've got uh, Mark in, in Edgemont there with uh, with the history there that we touched on. And, and we've, we've got a very strong team that has the ability to put this into production. But at the same time, I mean, I, I think there needs to be more consolidation in the U.S. uranium industry. Um, and, and look, you, you need to have companies that create scale. I mean, we, we go back and to, to the fact that, you know, the entire industry is $10 billion. Well, it's difficult for institutional investors or even you know high net worth retail investors to deploy capital into a lot of these stocks without moving the needle. So you know I think there's opportunities for synergies in the U.S. and and I think these opportunities for synergy synergy and synergistic acquisitions M and A um, are, are going to create you know stronger businesses that are you know able to compete globally um, a lot more efficiently. I, I think there's too much uh, segmentation in the industry right now. So. So, you know, in short, look, if, if the right opportunity comes along for us to merge with another company um, or be taken out by, um, 
you know, by a company at valuations that I think um, our shareholders are going to be supportive of, then uh, we'll certainly explore that as well. So, Blake, why now should potential investors be considering Arzaga Uranium? What would you say to potential investors that are listening? Well, I think, you know, I think we've touched on a lot already. Um, and, and I think we've, you know, we've, we've differentiated Dewey Burdock from an asset quality perspective. Um, you know, again, the best undeveloped ISR asset in the United States, in my view, uh, if not one of the top, top assets in the world, globally speaking. So, um, you know, we, we've got the updated PEA coming on Dewey Burdock. That's going to be a significant catalyst for our business. We've got the continued progression of permitting. Um, you know, as we touched on the finalization of the NRC license contention, the finalization of those EPA permits, we've got the renewed focus on ISR amenability at gas hills, the potential quantification of mineralization at the Dewey Burdock, or sorry, the Dewey Terrace project, which can serve as a satellite project, Dewey Burdock. So, you know, we've, we've got a lot of upcoming catalysts that are business specific. And, um, you know, aside from that, you've got the uh, U.S. Working Group recommendations that are due to come out on October 10th. And, and again, I say I want to I differentiate and we position uh, our asset at Azarga Dewey Burdock as internationally competitive. But that, that doesn't mean I won't take, uh, you know, the extra bump um, that could come along with this. And, and, you know, you've seen the UPA talk about, you know, seven and a half, you know, request to contract for seven and a half million pounds by 2025 or 10 million pounds by 2030 from U.S. companies. I mean, I'm certainly not going to complain about that, Andrew. Absolutely. No, I, I, I think that there's some, some good things coming there. Um, Blake, how can investors reach out to the company and, and to you for more information? Uh, look, we, we have uh, on our website an info at azargiuranium.com uh, contact. Uh, email address. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for interested parties to contact me directly. My email is blake at azargaresources.com. Um, you know, drop me a line at any point in time. I'll be I'll be responsive. Um, you know, we we've also got our website www.azargauranium.com. I think you know that that'll provide investors a good overview of our business. But but yeah, no, I, I, we, you know, it, it's important that we're responsive to share existing shareholders, potential shareholders, and, and, and we want to make sure that we are being that. Well, Blake, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and telling us about the company, and uh, we look forward to having you back in the future. Hey, no, I, I appreciate the time, Andrew. Thank you uh, very much.